All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome on in. Uh, thank you for joining us for another Jackrabbit webinar. Uh, today's topic, the two most common legal contracts and what you're likely missing, presented by Matthew Becker of Jim Lawyers, PLLC. Uh, if you haven't joined us before, my name is Mason. I'm the content marketer here at Jackrabbit, part of our marketing team, and I will be your host for today. Uh, now, before we dive in, I do want to mention that if you have any questions, um, please feel free to drop them in the chat while they're fresh on your mind, or you can hang on to them until the uh, very end of the presentation. We're going to have a short time dedicated to answering questions uh, at the end. So feel free to ask whichever way you prefer. And with that, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Matthew Becker. Matthew is the owner of Gym Lawyers PLLC. He started Gym Lawyers in 2021 in hopes of helping gym owners navigate the complex legal issues that impact their businesses. Matthew started practicing the law in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 2009 and opened his gym, Industrial Athletics, in 2013. He managed both businesses until 2019 when he started shutting down his litigation practice in order to dedicate his full time to helping gym members become better individuals. In 2021, he was approached by a micro gym consulting company and asked to fill the gap in professional services dedicated to helping gym owners. Matthew now helps gym owners in all stages of ownership from corporate setup and proper legal contracts when running a gym to assisting in the buying and selling process. So without further ado, Matthew, take it away. Thanks. Thanks, Mason. Hello, everybody. Uh, so great to see so many people on here to gather some information today. Uh, as, as Mason said, if you have questions, you know, th there's going to be a, hopefully a ton of questions that come to you guys uh, as I go. Um, please go ahead and drop them into the chat. Um, I'll gather them all up at the end and, 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 and try to go through them. And I promise I will do my best to answer the questions with something other than it depends, which is like the classic attorney answer is it depends because everything is so fact specific and situational, but um, I, I may you know, try to make a few assumptions in order to give you some sort of a, an answer. Uh, but primarily, we are here today to talk about the two legal contracts that every gym needs. And there are more than these two. But these are like the two basics. Okay. And those two are going to be the liability waiver and the membership contract. So it should not be a big surprise to anybody that if you're running a gym, and it doesn't really matter what kind of gym you're running, it could be, it could be a cheer and gymnastics, a cheerleading studio gym, it could be an all-star gym, it could be gymnastics, it could be swimming, uh, it could be dance. And in my field of gym ownership, it's, it's CrossFit and functional fitness, it could be powerlifting, it doesn't matter. Everybody needs a liability waiver. And so what we're essentially doing with the liability waiver is we're getting our members or participants to acknowledge that what we're doing is potentially dangerous um, and that they're going to participate anyway. So in the most basic form, the, the liability waiver is going to have the participant uh, waive their legal rights to sue you or your business technically in the event that they are going to get injured okay however it's never that simple in the law okay anybody who's ever had a dealing with an attorney knows that nothing is ever that simple um, and this is where we start to run into problems uh, because gym owners don't know nor should they all of the ins and outs that come along with these complex legal documents and so we end up seeing waivers uh, from gym owners that are insufficient and not covering the gym owners. You know, an example of this is a, a gym owner might send us a waiver to review and it might just be a one pager that has, you know, like 10 different numbered sentences or, or two sentences. And it might say something so basic as I waive my right to sue this company as a result of engaging in this activity. Okay. And for all intents and purposes, the gym owner sees this and says, it's a waiver, it's waiving, I'm good to go. Um, but it's not, that's not sufficient. And so what we're gonna do today is I'm gonna go into some practical, like three 
very specific provisions that your waiver needs in the event um, that you have to rely on that waiver in order to protect you. And this is all governing pretty much somebody gets injured and sues you. Okay. Or we'll talk about some other instances that you might encounter in a gym in which somebody might try to sue you. Okay. Uh, but we'll cover those three. And then on top of that, we're going to cover three other provisions that you can add to a waiver that almost no gym currently does in order to try to expand your waiver outside of simple injury. Okay. Uh, we have provided some handouts uh, that are available to you guys. Um, there's three different handouts. Some of the information we're going to cover is in those handouts. Some of it, the information in the handouts will go beyond what we're going to cover today. Um, but in those handouts, we do uh, provide some of that specific language, example language, um, that we're going to cover uh, during this webinar. One thing I would just caution you against is read. If you're going to copy and paste that simple language into your waiver, that sample language, read it, all right? Make sure that it applies to what you're doing. Um, that's sort of another issue that we run into when we review waivers from gyms is that it's very clear that they just copy and pasted this language from something else and it has nothing to do with their gym. My favorite example is, is the language in the waiver that applies to the climbing wall when the gym doesn't actually have a climbing wall, okay? All right. After we cover those three provisions uh, that your waiver has to have and those three additional provisions to help you build out your waiver a little bit, we're going to dive into membership contracts. And so every gym needs a membership contract because you are taking money from your clients in exchange for ideally some sort of service. Okay. And anytime money is involved, especially when we're supposed to be providing some sort of a service in exchange for that money, we need something in writing. Okay. And that written contract at least has to explain you give me $50 a month and in exchange for that, I give you X. Okay. Um, but again, it can't quite be that simple. Uh, so we have to build it out beyond that a little bit. Okay. And if there's one thing that I want you to take from the seminar today, okay, write this down. All right. The more expectations you can set with your members, the less likely you are to get sued as a result. Okay. Or said another way, the more expectations you can set with your members, the less liability exposure you have. We can take that to an extreme, right? Don't go out today and say, oh, well, cool. I'm gonna create a 30 page membership contract that covers every possible scenario that could ever come up in my gym. And so therefore my members can expect this and then they have the expectations they'll never sue me, All right? We can go too far with it and we can build out these contracts to have so much in them that nobody in their reasonable mind besides maybe myself and other attorneys are actually going to read it all right so but generally speaking the more expectations you can set the less legal exposure you have and so that's what we're going to try to do through a membership contract if you come into my facility and and you sign a contract that says you're going to pay me 150 dollars a month on the first of every month until you tell me that you don't want to anymore we have an expectation so the 1st of July rolls around and you get billed $150 a month for all intents and purposes. That was the expectation. You're not going to turn around and send me a nasty email that says, wait, why did I get charged $150 a month? Okay. Now, one more, I, I know we all have that one member who has done that, right? I get it. Uh, but let's go nine times out of 10, putting this stuff in writing is going to reduce those issues. All right. Okay. Let me go ahead and start diving into um, membership contracts. Or I'm sorry. No, I said well, I was going to start with liability waivers. We're going to start with liability waivers. So the three things that your liability waiver has to have in order for it to actually work as a liability waiver. Okay. The first of those is called the acknowledgement of danger. Right. Gym owners 
by their definition, run inherently dangerous businesses. Okay. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, if you walk into my gym, there's a, there's a good potential that, you know, you could trip over a barbell, you could trip over a dumbbell, you can get yourself injured. If you walk into a, a cheerleading, a tumbling gym, you are going to run down the mat and do a bunch of back handsprings. There's a potential that you're going to get injured, right? If you go to a dance studio, you know, there's sweat on the floor. You're going to slip and there's a potential you get injured. If, if you run a swim school and you've got people swimming, there's a potential of drowning, okay? So we all run some sort of inherently dangerous business. So the first thing we have to do is get the member, and either that's an adult member or that's nine times out of 10, a parent acknowledging that on behalf of their minor child, okay? They need to acknowledge that there's a danger in. Uh, maybe this activity is extremely strenuous, um, uh, but the, the one thing that we have to make sure is that the danger that our activity provides must actually be listed in our liability waiver, right? Let me give you an example. I've kind of given a couple, but let me give you an example. All right, again, let's say I'm running a cheerleading, uh, cheerleading gym, tumbling, okay? It's not, I can't say that, you know, my client may get injured um, while being in my gym. It's not specific enough, okay? I have to put in there, uh, you know, sprains, strains, broken bones, all right? Those are the most common injuries that we're going to see in a tumbling studio. So, you know, my waiver actually has to say that there's a danger that a participant, a client, uh, could suffer a muscular skeletal injury, okay? It's very specific. So that way, again, the person acknowledging the danger knows what it is that they're signing up for. Same thing in, in, in swimming. If we're, do, if we're in that swim school, our waiver has to say that there's a danger of drowning, okay? It's not enough just to say there's a danger of injury or death, which is like the standard common language, right? It has to say drowning. Um, so that way, the person acknowledging the danger can't say, well, I mean, death, cool, but like, I didn't know I could drown at this school. No, unfortunately, there is that danger, okay? And again, we provided some, some real basic, simple language um, in those, those handouts so that you can see what an acknowledgement of danger would look like, right? Let's go on to number two. Number two is the acceptance of responsibility. Okay, so now that I've acknowledged that I could potentially die, I could potentially drown, or I could potentially break a bone by participating at your gym, I now need to acknowledge or accept that, okay, cool, I acknowledge that I'm going to be injured, and I accept full responsibility of the fact that I'm still going to participate. So, yep, I could drown, that's fine, I still want to participate. Okay, so I am going to accept full responsibility of acknowledging the danger and choosing to participate still further in the activity, right? Um, that was pretty simple. That language uh, that we provided in the handout, um, you know, again, change the language a little bit because I think we just, you know, my, my sample here says fitness or training program might be a little bit different, but um, <clears throat> that, that's pretty good language. Okay, you just have to get them to accept that responsibility. All right, the third provision is the actual waiver of liability. And now we get pushed back at times. Um, sorry, Mary, is there a handout? Yes, uh, I just happened to catch that question. So somebody, uh, Mason, if you could uh, direct Mary on how to find that um, so that I don't keep referencing the handouts and they don't, they don't know where they are. But they're in there, Mary, I promise. Uh, okay, so we uh, the actual waiver of liability. Um, again, I'll, I'll get pushback every once in a while from a gym owner that says, "Well, the document is titled waiver of liability. Isn't like, isn't that what all this document does? Is waive liability? Yes, it is. That is, it is one hundred percent. That's it. But again, keep saying it's never that simple. Okay, so I actually need a section in my waiver. Uh, that says um, that as, as, as the, the person signing the waiver, you're, you're waiving liability, 
you're waiving important legal rights, you're indemnifying the, the company, and you're agreeing to hold that company harmless for any damages that you suffer as a result of participating in the activity at that company, okay? So your waiver actually has to have language that says this is what you're waiving under a heading of waiver of liability, okay? So those are the three things that our waivers have to have. And again, you know, if, if you're one of those gyms that currently has a waiver that's just a one pager um, that just has a couple of sentences in there, you should be able to see that from the sample language that we provided, it's a little bit more complex than that. And it needs to be built out a little bit more in order to, to protect you from that injury. Okay. So let's move on then to the three things, the three provisions that your waiver likely doesn't have, um, but it can help to expand out the waiver a little bit. And what I mean by that is, usually when we're talking a liability waiver, what we're talking about is waiving the right to sue for injury or death, okay? And that's usually, you know, that's, that's the, common, the, the, the common understanding is, is I'm coming in and I'm waiving uh, the ability to sue you if I get injured. But, there are other scenarios that we encounter in gyms that go beyond just simple injury, okay? There are other lawsuits that we see. Uh, there are other lawsuits that we talk to insurance companies about. And the first one, uh, so that we try to, to build out the waiver to protect the gym owners against a little bit more is physical touch, right? Or, or as we really like to call it in technical terms, physical contact, okay? Um, because we all run a, a fitness facility uh, in which the coach or trainer um, is likely going to have some kind of physical contact with the client at some point during the client's time at your gym, okay? In my realm, again, CrossFit functional fitness, we call it a tactile cue, right? Somebody is lifting, they put their body in a bad position, I go over and I physically touch the member in order to indicate you know, you need to adjust this portion of your body. You need to push your knees out against my hand here in order to align your knees correctly, right? It's a tactile cue. And tumbling, gymnastics, cheer, we call it spotting, okay? I'm gonna put my hand against your low back and I'm gonna help you move uh, so that you land properly and you don't injure yourself. Same thing in dance, you know, we have spotting. Um, you know, I'm not really quite sure what you would call it in a, a swim school other than just like holding the child up to keep the child from going under, right? But there's going to be physical touch. And because of that, we want to put the member on notice or the parent of the child on notice that the child is likely going to experience some sort of physical contact. It'll be professional and it'll be from us, but it may also be from somebody else. Right? What if another member walks up and touches your child? Okay, it could happen. And if that's gonna be a problem, then the parent either needs to tell you that and, and not join your facility, or they need to let you know that they're not comfortable being touched so that you have the opportunity to modify your services so that the participant does not experience any physical contact. The second of these important uh, provisions that we need to add to a liability waiver in an effort to try to build it out um, <clears throat> goes to uh, service animals, okay? And this is one that we're seeing increase more and more. And the more that our services are becoming inclusive, the more that you know, mental health is becoming a regular thing that we talk about, the more that adaptive athletes and adaptive athlete programs expand, the more we are seeing service animals entering into gyms, okay? In the United States, at least, and I'm not sure, you know, if you guys are in or, or out of the United States, but in the United States, at the very least, we cannot tell somebody that they can't bring a service animal into our facility as long as our facility is open to the public. But it creates a problem because the service animal, usually probably a dog or something like that, is going to come into the facility and now we have the potential of adding a layer of danger and we need to protect ourselves against that. So while we can't tell a member you can't bring your service animal um, 
into the facility, what we can do is we can say, well, your service animal has to be a certified service animal for one. Okay, we can set that requirement in our waiver. Um, so that way they're not bringing in like their comfort ferret um, into your facility and, and calling it a service animal and, and wanting it to be there with them. Um, we can say that the, uh, the facility, uh, or, or I'm sorry, the, the service animal um, must be up to date with its, its, its shots or its vaccinations. Um, and then we need to be put on notice that they're going to bring the service animal prior to them coming in or prior to them bringing the service animal. Now I get it. If they show up first time at your facility and, and then they would sign the waiver, that's fine. Uh, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Um, but then beyond that, we need to sort of push liability off. Okay, so let's look at this scenario. Let's say for a second that um, I, I walk into your facility and you don't have this in your waiver, okay? And I'm just a regular member in your facility um, and you know I'm engaging in whatever class you offer, uh, but a new member joins and they have a certified service animal and they bring that animal in, okay? If you don't have anything in your waiver, you, the owner of the gym, are now potentially on the hook if that service animal does something like bites me. We have, we have two potential dangers um, when somebody brings in a service animal. Okay? One is biting. And I think I was using the example of, you know, I'm the member and even though it's a service animal, there's always a potential that an animal is going to bite. Okay? Um, and, and so the, the other danger that we run into is property damage. Okay, again, they're service animals, but what happens if that service animal pees on your mats? Okay, um, <clears throat> or, you know, again, in, in, in my realm, um, we have different types of equipment. What happens if a service animal comes in and pees on one of the, the concept two rowers or something like that? Okay, um, <clears throat> and then causes some property damage that could then potentially cause the gym owner to have to incur costs in order to replace the, pro the piece of property that was damaged, All right? Um, so what we can do in our waiver is by putting in language involving service animals is one, again, uh, make sure that they're certified, two, they need to be vaccinated, uh, three, you need to be on notice that the service animal's coming, and then four, you push liability off onto the the owner of the service animal to say you can come in but if your service animal causes any damage in the realm of property damage or human damage biting you maintain liability for that and you agree to hold harmless my company for the damage that your animal caused okay um so it's just again it's the, the added layer of an inability to prevent this potential liability from coming into your facility, but we can try to push that, uh, that monetary liability um, off onto the person who has the service animal um, to make sure that even though you're exposing yourself to liability, you don't have to absorb those potential costs and dangers, okay? All right, the third thing, the third provision that this is probably one that we do see every so often, um, but it's enough. I don't see it enough that I want to make sure that you guys know about it. Um, and that would be the um, consent to medical services. Okay. Uh, and so let me run another scenario here. Let's say that you don't have a consent to medical services in your waiver. And, and I'll actually use a, a personal example. This happened to me um, in my facility, oh man, maybe like eight years ago now. <clears throat> we had a member go down in the middle of a big workout. And now we know that that member was having a heart attack, but at the time we did not know that. We all just assumed as the member did uh, that they were suffering from heat exhaustion and, and, uh, and dehydration. So the member is lying on the floor, pale, and I walked over to the member and said, do you want me to call an ambulance? Right? And that member said, no. Uh, as you would probably find out, um, if, you have, if, if you are required to reach out to an emergency contact before you engage um, emergency services, there are times when either adults or the, the parents of your minor children will say, 
don't call an ambulance because I don't want to pay for it, right? You, the gym owner, aren't going to pay for it. Um, so the parent or the adult member, they don't, they don't, they may not want to pay for it either. You know, and if they're not at the facility at the time that, that your client is injured, they don't, may not understand the scope of the injury itself. And this could potentially put the individual at danger um, further because uh, you don't have um, the ability to call an ambulance without first receiving consent. Okay, so that's sort of like issue number one. And so what we're going to do is we're going to put in our waivers that you get consent as the gym owner to make that call. If you believe that this individual needs emergency medical services because your waiver is going to say, we don't provide medical services, um, and you believe that this member needs emergency medical services, you now have the ability, the consent through your waiver, to contact emergency medical services. Okay. And then the second element of this is, <clears throat> okay, well, cool. Uh, I just gave you consent to call an ambulance on my behalf, but now what happens if you call an ambulance and the ambulance comes, picks me up, and drives me to the, to the emergency room, but in the process gets in an accident and I'm further injured because you called an ambulance, okay? Or in the realm of, again, parents with children, you didn't call the parent first because you don't need to in order to call an ambulance, but the parent could turn around and say, well, had you called, I wouldn't have consented, okay? And now my child's further injured because they got in an accident. So the second element of this consent to medical services, one, you get consent to to engage emergency medical services, but two, you also do not maintain any liability if further injury is caused in the course of maintaining or acquiring emergency medical services. Okay, so again, two things there, <clears throat> building out that waiver with these three additional provisions. So uh, one was physical contact, two was the presence of service animals in your facility, and three, the consent to engage medical services uh, in, the evolved, in the event of an, an injury, that's gonna help expand that liability waiver to protect you more, to eliminate more legal exposure that you have simply by running a gym. Okay. Now I've seen a couple of questions come in. Um, I will come back to that in the end. So just stay tight. Uh, we do have the second contract to address, which is the membership contract. All right, so let's let's move into that, and then we'll come back to waiver questions. Now, I'll make sure I get those answered toward the end. Um, so we've got a membership contract, and uh, you know the the basic provision here, or the basic idea of a membership contract. I think I mentioned a little bit ago is if you're paying me to perform some sort of service, I want to get that in writing. Okay, we're setting expectations. The more we set expectations, the less legal exposure we have as gem owners. Okay, so we need to set that expectation. And, and so we put all of this in writing so that the member knows what to expect is going to happen with their money on a month to month basis, on an every four week basis, on an every three month basis, you know, whatever your membership contract terms are. Okay. But again, we have to build this guy out a little bit so that we provide you, the gym owner, the maximum amount of protection that we can, okay? And so then we're gonna cover three primary provisions or three, three primary sections that you need to have in your membership contract in order to protect yourselves and, and really make it enforceable, okay? The first is going to be the automatic renewing and cancellation terms, okay? Now I'm gonna make an assumption that the majority of you on this webinar have some sort of automatically recurring membership, okay? Uh, let's just assume that it's on a monthly basis. You charge $50 a month for your service. At the time that they sign up, they then, uh, are you know, the, the parent or the adult member or whatever agrees to pay $50 a month, and then every month on the first of the month or their anniversary date, it just automatically hits their bank account for that. Cool. We need to outline all of that in our membership contract. What is the price of the service? How often does it renew? What are the billing dates? Okay. Uh, and then alternatively, how do they get out of it? Okay. 
If a member decides and they're in an automatically recurring membership, if they decide they want to get out of the membership at some point, how do they do it? And we want to be very clear about that because that's where a lot of these problems come up is we are not clear in our membership cancellation requirements. And so people see extra payments, people want refunds, and we've never told them in our membership contract that they don't have a right to make those claims. Right? So we have to provide them their cancellation policy. How many days in advance of their next payment do you need notice of cancellation in order to process the cancellation? And then if they don't give you notice in that amount of time, are you going to take another payment off of them? What form does that notice need to come in? Ideally, it's in written form, uh, but you know, is it, is it an email? Do you have a form on your website? Is it a text message? Uh, we always recommend that it's in some way in a written format um, that you then have like a timestamp record of. Okay? Um, so we have to tell them how do you get out of your membership contract. So that's sort of like number one is all the, all the automatically recurring terms. Uh, and, and one other one that you may, you may also include in there would be something like a hold or a freeze term. If you know, parents want to take their kids on a three week vacation in the middle of summer, can they hold or freeze their membership payment um, for that month that they're primarily going to be out of town? And if so, again, what's the notice requirement? How many days in advance? What form does that notice need to come in? What happens if they don't give you proper notice? Okay. Set these expectations in written format that the parents are acknowledging. You know, and, and, and you know, let, me, let me back up just for a second on, on all of this that we're talking because Jackrabbit provides you guys, and, and <laughs> this is product promotion, uh, Jackrabbit provides you guys a, a, a wonderful opportunity to do this with these different provisions because what you can do is you can build out your contracts online by taking each of these sections that we're talking about and creating an individual provision for that within the system and then pull all of those provisions into one contract. And so the parent has to go through or the client has to go through and they have to acknowledge by checking a box or by agreeing to each one of these sections. And that makes it really great. You don't just have one giant section with all of this in it because you know the parents or the, the, adult, the adult client is not gonna read all of that. So you have something like, you, know, you just have their payment terms, and then you just have their cancellation terms, and you just have their hold terms. And they have to acknowledge each one of these. So they can't come back later and say, well, I never saw that, you know, because, yeah, you did, you know, because you checked that box. Okay. Whether or not you read it, that's not my issue. You checked the box that said you read it. Okay. All right, so that's number one. Number one of our membership contracts, payment terms. Number two. It's what we call an EFT disclosure, an electronic funds transfer disclosure. Uh, this is very important for any gems that are taking payments through ACH transactions. Right? It is also important just to get the disclosure for those who are taking payments through credit cards and debit cards. Right? There is some debate as to whether or not the electronic funds transfer of the federal law applies to credit cards and debit cards, um, but we just throw it in there and that way you're covered regardless. Uh, in its basic form, an EFT disclosure gives the gym owner the power and the ability to hit the client's bank account on that regular recurring basis, okay? Also, if your facility sells other things, you know, maybe it sells other products, or maybe it sells other services, or maybe you have specialty events, or you do a, a t-shirt sale or, or something like that. An EFT disclosure gives the gym owner the power to process the card that's on file for different things outside of the membership contract. Okay, uh, okay. so another example, you know, you have a, a cheerleading gym and you have a pro shop and within that pro shop you sell all kinds of different stuff and a parent comes in and says, you know, I want to buy this shirt and maybe you aren't set up yet to process that card at that immediate time that they're buying that shirt. But you say, cool, go ahead, take the shirt. I'll charge you for it later. The EFT disclosure gives you the ability to make that charge. Okay. Or um, 
you're going to sign up, you're going to hold some sort of internal competition and everybody has to pay $10 to participate in the internal competition. Everybody just signs up on a form uh, that they want to participate and then you take that form and run all of those transactions at a later basis. EFT disclosure gives you the power to do that. Okay? Nine times out of 10, we may not see issues with this, but again, we're setting expectations. So we want that language in our membership contracts so that we have the ability to waive that membership contract in the event that we ever see a problem. Okay. The third and final big section that we want to see in membership contracts are state law provisions. Right? And, and this is a big one because a lot of states, there are a few that don't, but a lot of states have some variation of what's called a health club act. And what a health club act generally does is says things like if you're running a gym um, and sometimes that state's definition of a gym may or may not apply to the type of gym that you're running but we got to check it uh, but let's assume that your your gym does fall within the definition if you're running a gym you have to have a written membership contract your written membership contract has to list these different things uh, and Here's some verbatim cancellation language that must go into your membership contract verbatim. You can't change it. Usually, this is going to apply to something like if your member moves 25 miles from your facility while being a member, you have to give that member the, ab the ability to cancel their membership contract outside of your regular cancellation policy. Or, the state law is going to require you to put what's called a buyer's remorse clause in your membership contract. And what that means is if you're taking regular automatically recurring payments, and the law we call those installment payments, um, then you have to tell the member at, the, at, a, at a big paragraph right above their signature line that they have the ability to cancel their membership within a certain amount of time of signing the contract with no penalty. And usually it's like three or five days, okay? But you have to have this information in there if your state has these laws and if your state defines your gym as falling within these laws. Otherwise, if you run into a problem, your contract is completely unenforceable, okay? So we have to make sure this language is in those written membership contracts. And again, the review of those are, uh, you need to have your automatic payment recurring cancellation hold terms. You need to have disclosures that give you the ability to take regular recurring payments, uh, especially through ACH transactions, but might be through credit cards or debit cards. Um, or, or also, let me add to that, if you charge a fee, you know, for, um, <clears throat> let's say you charge a fee if the, if the payment misses, Right? If somebody has insufficient funds at the time in which they you process their payment, and you're going to charge them a fee for that, that needs to go in your EFT disclosure. Or three, you know, three that the third provision that needs to go in your membership contract are any and all state law provisions that your state, you know, if you're operating in, in California or Texas or Florida, um, New York, you know, those are a few that come right to mind that I know have uh, North Carolina you know, that have these health club acts, um, then you need to make sure that that language, and I think somebody said they were from Ontario, Canada. I cannot speak to Canadian law, okay? You can't take this as like the legal advice that like you also needed up in Canada. But I will tell you that um, in my review, Ontario does have some sort of a health club act. So you may want to take your contract to an attorney and ask about it um, because I do believe that it is there. Okay, um, and so then we, we build those out and now between our liability waiver and our membership contract, we have set a lot of written expectations with our members that are going to help to reduce the liability of the gym and the gym owner themselves. Okay, uh, so we had a lot of questions rolling in um, as, we, as, as I was talking. So I'm gonna go back through now and start to address some of those questions. Um, and again, I promise I'll, I'll try to do it without, it depends, um, but I might have to. I reserve the right. All right, let me, let me back up here. Okay. So 
So somebody said, I work with a nonprofit school, but hoping that the legal issues may be similar. Yes, um, they, are, they are similar. Okay? You, still, you can still get sued as a nonprofit. You still need to have these disclosures and you still need to have these expectations. Um, next question. Right. Should we have them sign a liability waiver every year or once is sufficient? Uh, fantastic question. The only reason you need to have somebody sign a liability waiver every year is if you've changed your liability waiver within the last year. Technically speaking, if you change the liability waiver, then you should have everybody re-sign the liability waiver instantly. Okay. Um, now, adding on to that, you really should have a review of your liability waiver, all of your contracts, really, you should have it go under some sort of a review once a year uh, because laws change, laws update, things happen. Um, you know, they, like I've said, with, with service animals, that's sort of something that's, that's up and coming um, <clears throat> that we have seen with different lawsuits. Uh, so, you know, there, there are things that sort of move up Physical touch is something that when I started my gym 10 years ago, we would have never even thought about, okay? It, it was enough just to like say to a member, you know, hey, we engage in, in tactile cues. Are you okay if I touch you? Um, and, and that was enough. Nowadays, it, you know, it, it may not be enough. So I have had to go back in my gym and add those provisions, uh, which then spawned me to have to get everybody to re-sign those. Um, something else, to to note on that sort of same note of having people re-sign this goes a little bit beyond what what the material was that we were originally going to, to, to discuss today but um a lot of you know cheer gymnastics dance uh, a lot of these studios have members that start as minors and then become adults okay they start as minors and they're usually there like through call or through high school and they turn 18 during their senior year or they continue to come back during college like on breaks and things like that and years ago when they joined as a minor the gym had the parent sign a waiver on behalf of the minor child great perfect that's what you should be doing but now that child that minor child is now an adult and that necessitates that child to re-sign a waiver on behalf of themselves as an adult. Okay, so something else to note on that one. Um, you know, panned out, got it. Can you put the liability waiver inside a team competition contract? No. Do not combine your membership contract and your liability waiver. Okay, that's a big no-no. They need to be two separate and distinct documents. You never want to walk into a situation where somebody you present somebody that dual document and say but you agreed to this and they say i didn't know that was a membership contract i thought that was a liability waiver or i only paid attention to the membership terms on that i didn't know i was waiving my right to sue you in the in, in, as a result of the injury we always make them two separate and distinct documents Uh, is my facility open to the public if you have to be registered to be there? Uh, yes. Um, the only reason that it would not be open to the public is if you had some sort of a requirement in order to be a member to be there. Okay. So, for example, you know, you have like private golf clubs. Nobody from the public can technically walk into a private golf club without paying $1,500 a month in order to be a member to be there. My facility, at least, and maybe yours is different, my gym is open to the public. If somebody walks in and they have previous CrossFit experience and they want to drop into my class, I'm going to let them do that. Okay. Um, my gym is, is technically open to the public. Right? I'm not categorized as a private business. Um, so you, you just you, you don't want to walk into issues between uh, private and public when you're taking members in from the public and you don't have any real requirements in order for them to become a member of your gym. Uh, you don't want to mess with that when it comes to the ADA or the Americans with Disabilities Act. If, if that becomes a really big issue, 
call a local attorney and, 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 and explain your situation to them um, and see if you can't get yourself categorized as a private business. All right, going down through. Um, I'm working with a nonprofit school, but hoping the. Oh, did I go back? No, I think I'm okay. All right, I'm hitting the issues, all of my sound issues. There's no certification of service animals. Um, I'm not sure that I agree with that 100%. Um, <clears throat> you can have a service dog. I don't think you can have a service snake, right? You can say that your, your, your snake is, is your service animal, but I don't think they have, you know, there's, there's no, official process by which the snake can go through and, 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 and get any sort of a certification. But uh, Dina, I'm going to look into that. And if, if you are correct and my, my wording of certification is incorrect, then I'll be sure to change my wording um, beyond certification. Um, but there's going to be a difference between somebody being able to bring in a service dog uh, versus somebody being able to bring in just a snake or a ferret that they call their service animal. Uh, two questions. Is the animal required because of a disability and what work or task has the dog been trained to perform? Um, uh, that's a tough question, tough two-part question. Okay. Is the animal required because of the disability? Um, yeah, I, I think otherwise it wouldn't really qualify under the Americans with Disabilities Act and that individual is not protected in order to bring, sorry if my dog, you can hear my dog in the background. Um, but <clears throat> if the individual is not disabled and just has an animal that they bring with them, then they're not protected necessarily for you saying they're not allowed to have their animal with them. If they have a recognized disability, that's when the Americans with Disabilities Act is gonna kick in and you can't say to them like, you can't bring your service animal into my facility. We see this a lot with uh, with veterans, right? With veterans that have PTSD and need a service dog or or, or an emotional support animal, um, you know, they they have a, a diagnosed PTSD diagnosis, and and they they've been working to get this animal. Uh, this animal has been trained in some way in order to provide them emotional support uh, when it's done. Uh, you know, so. So that's what we're looking for when we're talking about service animals. Um, and what work or task has been uh, the dog trained for? I, that's just a conversation that you're gonna have to have with the member. Do you have good language about service animals? Terry, um, reach out to me directly. Um, no, I don't, I don't have it queued up right now to, to like copy and paste in here, but if you reach out to me directly, I'm happy to have that conversation with you. Um, and I think somebody will, will put my contact information in the chat, uh, but basically jimlawyers.com and I have calls to action all over the website you guys can fill out. All right, I bring my personal dog with me sometimes on occasion. I use my dog in class. Any thoughts on that? I'd be curious about how you use your dog in class. Um, and I would also put your insurance company on notice of that. Um, I know uh, we work directly with an, a, an insurance company. Not, I mean, not, I guess not directly, but we have a, a good working relationship with an insurance company. Um, and their position is no animals in a facility unless they're a service animal ever, okay, um, because of the potential of bite. So <clears throat> I would just say if you're going to take your own animal, make sure you contact your um, your insurance provider and you let them know that, that that's how you're using your animal in the facility. Is there a type of lawyer you recommend to review our liability waivers? Sure, me. No. Um, you want to find a local attorney that is probably a personal injury attorney of sorts if you're going to go with somebody local. 
um, it, it is a service that we offer in review of contracts. Uh, so you're welcome to reach out and get a hold of us. But any any personal injury attorney should be at least able to look to see if your liability waiver is protecting you against a simple injury. How can I protect my business from any claims by parents that might come into the facility and trip and fall, for example? They sign my waiver as it pertains to their child, participants, and activities, but should something be included about visitors or spectators? My technical answer is yes. Um, from a very strict legal standpoint, anybody who walks into your facility should be signing a liability waiver. Um, now, practically speaking, it doesn't always work out that way because it's, you know, it, it's awkward to do so. Um, but if that's a concern, and I think that's a legitimate concern, anybody who walks into your facility should be signing a waiver. And you might just have to have a waiver redrafted to apply to the individual signing it instead of signing it on behalf of their child, uh, applying to um, the premises. It's what we would call a premise liability waiver. We have a waiver from a provincial association. Should I have one for our own gymnastics gym? Uh, boy, I don't know if I can get away with this one without, it depends. Um, I'm gonna say yes, you should have one specifically, but that is an instance where I would, I would wanna better understand the relationship um, between you and the, the provincial association. So that one I might have to say, reach out to me uh, before I can give you a definitive answer. But my basic answer is gonna be yes. I, I, I would, without knowing more, I would say your gymnastics gym needs their own liability waiver. Similar question. I have had is how to, oh, okay. I've had is how to handle when a parent brings another family member like, chi like children that are not members and they choose to be to let their child play an unused area of the facility. Oh, this stuff just gives me the heebie jeebies. Um, first off, no, <laughs> that child is not permitted to run around in your gym and expose themselves to liability. Uh, if you are going to allow that, that parent needs to sign a waiver on that child's behalf. Uh, when we go through a contract and they agree to go i go through it with them and ensure they understand each section okay very cool paul that's great um what about a customer that wants to take their card off file should we have it in writing that we require a card on file to make sure that we have the ability to charge them in case they don't pay with cash or check yes that would be an eft disclosure do non-gym type businesses need the state law provisions i run a music school um no uh, the, the, there may be some other, you know, there, there may be some other consumer protection laws within your state that apply depending on how you process payments. But generally speaking, the health club act that I mentioned applies to gems and would not apply to something like a music school. Are the mechanisms provided in Jackrabbit online check boxes suitable and forcible, even though they lack a physical signature? Uh, that's a really great question, Greg. And what I'm going to say is to check the boxes to acknowledge each one of those provisions, that's acceptable. That's nothing different than just having like an initial line in the physical contract. The, the reason that I prefer Jackrabbit in your industry over something like iClass Pro is because Jackrabbit at least then requires the signer of the contract to type their name and acknowledge that, that is their electronic signature. Um, what we have done with gym owners who have contacted us to have contracts drafted up and are using Jackrabbit is to put a provision at the end of the contract that says typing my name is the same as my electronics or as, as my physical right signature. Um, is a separate waiver for people that bring on service animals or on the waiver for all? Um, I typically just put them right in the right. Just, it's just a, a couple paragraphs that just go in your standard waiver. And that way you don't have to separate people out. Uh, do you need an electronic signature? Oh, whoops, sorry, I skipped that other question. For the state law provisions, do we have to list each provision individually or can we simply state that our contract includes any and all state law provisions? You need to put each one of those provisions in your contract individually um, because it's oftentimes verbatim disclosures that need to go in your contract. 
Um, do you know of anything we can do to shoot? There's like a box that's cut oh, there regarding social media, regulatory actions by disgruntled former members. Uh, people who don't read these provisions usually threaten to put bad reviews on social media. Yeah, I understand that. And unfortunately, in, in today's society, there's about no way of preventing anybody from going out there and, and smacking you with a one star review. Um, you know, I, I get it at my gym. Um, I've talked to other gym owners that have the problem. The, the more so usually what I will say in this instance is, you know, we, we put all of these contracts together and put all of these provisions within contracts in order to try to catch those nine out of 10 people. We're always going to be faced with that one out of 10 person. And we have all had them in our gym that drive us nuts and take up more of our time than anybody else. And we're never, there's nothing we can do that are going to prevent those people from coming into our facility. Uh, the most that we can do is put these people on notice of these provisions as much as possible, as regularly as possible, in an effort to try to head those things off from happening. Um, seeing in Wisconsin law a requirement regarding privacy policy for locker rooms. Yep, very good, Amy. Um, any thoughts on media release for taking photos? Yep, that just goes in your standard liability waiver. You just need a paragraph or two that says that you reserve the right to use their likeness um, through video, audio, um, uh, pictures that you can then use uh, in your marketing or distribute it in order to promote your gym. Um, what about online classes? Any different specific waivers as they won't have supervision and their responsibility for safe space mats? Uh, for online, I assume you mean some sort of virtual on camera. There are two specific provisions that you need to make sure are in a liability waiver. One is a digital audio visual disclosure that basically has people acknowledging that they're going to be on camera and that you're going to be listening to them and that you may be recording a session and that somebody else might be in the room that can see it that they cannot see when they're on camera. Um, and then the other section is you need to make sure that your waiver has a uh, what's called a, a jurisdiction and venue portion that maintains the proper legal jurisdiction, legal place and law to be in the state and the county and where you're located, as opposed to people who might be, you know, in a different state or a different county, um, also enjoying your online services. Uh, we're getting really close. We've been going for about an hour. Um, I don't know, it, Mason, if you want to hop back in here, uh, I'm happy to continue to answer some of these questions, but, you know, I've got all kinds, <laughs> all kinds moving down and through here. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure how much time you want me to take to answer these. For sure. Hey, yeah, that, uh, if you want to take a couple more, uh, completely fine. If not, uh, for everyone, I'm going to go ahead and drop, um, Jim lawyers and Matthew's contact information, uh, in the chat again, if he's not able to get to your question. That way y'all can reach out to him, uh, individually. So I'll drop that here and yeah, Matthew, if you want to take just a couple more and okay. uh, we'll go from there. Okay. I'll keep firing these off. All right. How do we find out our state provisions are a health club act? If we fall under an act as a dance studio, California, California does have a health club act. Um, I usually you can start with Google and you may need to, to search with some variation of California health club act, California fitness facility act, California health spa law, you know, any and all variation of that. Um, nine times out of 10, that will pop up, at least notice that something exists and will lead you to look into it a little bit further. Can you comment on how to include a clause whereby the gym is allowed to post pictures of social media after verbal or written consent? What is your recommendation? Can you comment on how to include a clause whereby the gym is allowed to post pictures, I think that means on social media after verbal or written consent. I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, I think the, the, short, the short answer would be, you would just put that in the language that 
gives you the ability to use their likeness for your marketing? I'm not sure. Frank, I'm sorry. I'm not sure I get the question. What specifics need to be included on field trips, birthday parties, and other gym events? Jennifer, sorry, that's going a little bit beyond the scope of what I'm, I'm set to cover today, but love to talk to you about field trips, lots of issues there, birthday parties, big issue, um, other gym event waivers. Yep, you need specific things. Uh, Jennifer, if there's any chance that you are a cheerleading gym and any chance that you know next generation gym owners and any chance you're going to be in Dallas this weekend, I will be giving a lecture there on birthday party contracts. Uh, otherwise, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'd be happy to have that conversation with you. Uh, are we in any danger of offering free trial class and should we have them sign a waiver to attend free trial class? Yes, you should. Um, we use parent volunteers for recitals, should they sign a waiver of liability? Um, yes, I would have them do so. There's a potential that they're going to get injured. Um, you would have just have a liability waiver written up specifically for your recital and have those, those volunteers sign off on that, that there's a potential danger that they're gonna get kicked or whatever it would be. Um, what about emotional support animals? Um, I mean, I, I would put those in under service animals if they're for some sort of a disability. Um, if you have an issue, or I shouldn't say an issue, if you have a situation in your gym where somebody is trying to bring an emotional support animal and you want to support that individual in bringing that animal, that's fine. Um, have them sign an addendum to their waiver that basically covers the provisions that we suggested as far as service animals are concerned. Um, Do the different sections in Jackrabbits meet the separate waiver requirements for membership and liability waivers? So my understanding of Jackrabbit is that you can create two different groups of provisions. You can have a membership contract group that pulls in all of your membership contract provisions. You can have a general liability group that pulls in all of the provisions of your general liability. Um, <clears throat> I will do uh, two, two more. Um, All right, according to ADA law, those are the only two questions you can ask. Oh, got it, okay. Uh, Jason, what if, I, I think that was in reference to a question you asked earlier. Uh, what if another member is allergic to dogs for service animals? Oh boy, we're getting into the weeds on that one. Um, have a conversation with the parents of both kids or have a conversation with both members about how you can try to work that out. Uh, what if other members that would be there are allergic? Okay, same thing. Um, okay, so uh, that's I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and 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 we're running a little bit over an hour here, um, guys. I really appreciate. It. There's like 16 messages that I can't get to. Um, Mason told me to 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 cut it off. Um, please, you guys have my website. I'm happy to answer these questions. I just can't do it right here um, based on the, the amount of time that I was allotted. So I really appreciate everybody showing up. I really appreciate all of the questions. I really appreciate you listening to what I have to say. Um, our goal here is to help you guys through this information um, and make sure that you don't have legal exposure that's unnecessary. So please reach out, happy to answer those questions. Thanks so much, Matt. Uh, like like Matthew said, uh, we have dropped the contact information for gym lawyers in the chat a couple times. So if y'all have any other questions, you can reach him there, uh, get some one-on-one -on -one time. Um, yeah, I want to thank uh, Matthew Becker for being with us today. Uh, thank you all for being with us today. Uh, if you took away any wins in particular and you'd like to share them with us, be sure to tag us at Jackrabbit Tech on Instagram and Facebook and at Jackrabbit Technologies on LinkedIn. And you can find Jim Lawyers at Jim Lawyers PLLC on Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, as a reminder for you all, we'll be sending out an email with options to watch the replay demand, on demand uh, within the next 24 hours or so. Uh, so once again, thank you all so much for being here. I hope you took away something uh, new and important. Uh, we appreciate your attendance and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks for joining us, everybody.